Welcome to our book chat for today. We haven't done one of these in a while, um, but this one's on a new book um, that came out called Picture a Professor, and it's a collection of essays by faculty about interrupting biases uh, about faculty and increasing student learning. And Jessamine Newhouse edited this, this edition. Um, so the plan for today is I'm going to give like a little bit of an overview of the book because the whole idea behind the book chat is that you don't have to have read the book in order for you to come and benefit from the book chat. So I'll give sort of an overview of some of the things that are in the book, um, as well as why I think it's worthwhile to read the book. Um, yeah, let me grab from my notes here a link to uh, NIU. If you sign in, you have uh, access to the ebook version of this, and I requested that from the library a few months ago when I planned to do this book chat. So there's the um, the URL to, to find that, the permalink for the URL in the chat here. So if you want to read this book, which I definitely recommend, um, then you can do so in ebook version or you can request the um, the physical text as well or buy it. I'm plan on, I read the, the ebook through the library, but after having read it, I'm planning on buying the book and, and going through it and kind of making my, my notes and highlights and stuff in my own physical copy. All right, so let's chat first. Um, well, first I'll, I'll introduce myself. I, that probably would be a good idea. I'm Amanda Smothers. Um, I'll share my video briefly too. Um, I'm Amanda Smothers and I am the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. I've been with the center uh, for over four years now. Um, so pre-pandemic and then through the pandemic and now into the endemic. Um, but I've been in higher education for 15 years. Um, I started out at NIU actually um, with my getting my master's in British and American literature and then my PhD in English um, as well. Um, I was a teaching graduate teaching assistant for um, all of my studies uh, until I ran out of funding with my PhD uh, a year before I finished. Um, I also teach currently, in addition to working in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, I teach at area colleges too. So right now I'm teaching at Elgin Community College. I also teach at Harper College and Columbia College in Chicago. Um, and I've taught at other community colleges in the area as well in the past. So enough about me and my messy office that you've seen behind me. Um, one of the, the quotes that Jessamine Newhouse shares in her introduction is by Bell Hooks, and it says, the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. And I thought that was a great quote to start off our book chat today, um, talking about the ways in which we can kind of radicalize higher education in our classrooms um, by taking up space there. So I have a few passages from the introduction that I do want to kind of read to set the stage for the rest of the discussion today um, and kind of give us a sense of what um, the intent behind this collection is as well as you know what we might be able to gain from it. Um, so in her introduction, um, Newhouse says, Super Professor appears over and over again on our TV and movie screens, quite wrongly depicting learning as a purely top-down activity, whereby knowledge is simply poured into students' heads by an irrefutable expert. He's also usually an able-bodied, cisgendered, heterosexual white man. In this way, popular culture reflects and reinforces the myriad of political, social, and cultural discourses that gender intellectual authority as male and support um, the term white body supremacy by racializing knowledge and expertise as white. Socialized and enculturated by this imagery all too often, super professor is who we think of when we picture a professor. Every single person teaching a college class in any subject or modality must contend in some way with the narrowly defined limited slash limiting expectations of how a college professor should act in the classroom, what they should look like, 
and what identity markers they should embody. Anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, anyone who doesn't manifest those traits before saying a single word or interacting in any way with students will not meet certain conscious and unconscious student expectations and expectations shape learning. Moreover, biases about professors impact students' ability to connect and build rapport with instructors and to fully engage in the course material. So this collection takes as its starting point the socially imagined professor, um, impedes effective teaching and learning. So assumptions about what professors look like directly contribute to um, disparate teaching realities, white women, women faculty of color, faculty with physical disabilities, non-binary faculty, and all black, indigenous, and people of color faculty must navigate different intersectional mazes of racial, gender, and other biases about embodied identity on an exhausting daily basis. And then skipping ahead, um, there's another passage um, early in the introduction that talks about the, the scholarship of teaching and learning, or SOTL. Um, and Newhouse mentions that a wide range of scholarly books and articles, research, research studies, memoirs, and social media extensively documents these inequities and shows how prejudices manifest in different scholarly disciplines in different ways, such as additional biases against all women faculty in the STEM fields. The sexism and racism of academic systems are particularly evident when it comes to student evaluations of teaching and the disproportionate power these evaluations hold over professional teaching careers. However, published scholarship of teaching and learning SOTL and popular advice about college classroom management, learning assessment, and other teaching stratagems frequently fails to adequately address or even acknowledge this simple truth. Embodied identity matters to college teaching and learning. And so um, Newhouse argues that SOTL needs to much more thoroughly and methodically grapple with all the ways that society and academia's systemic inequities and hierarchies traverse our individual classrooms and to better address the implicit professor theory um, in one of the chapters. And she also argues that more scholars of teaching and learning need to offer actionable pedagogical approaches that recognize the significance of embodied identity and propose real life teaching strategies. And then that is the aim of this collection is to give those real life teaching strategies, those tools, those means, activities, methods, processes that help to empower the plurality of professors in their teaching practices. So there are four sections to this book. The first part um, has a few chapters on just the first day of teaching and some strategies for starting strong, particularly um, for um, people who do not quote unquote look like the um, conceptualization of a professor in their students' minds. Um, for part two, there's a, some chapters on making connections, strategies for building trust and rapport with students. Part three has some anti-racist pedagogy chapters, um, some strategies for an increase, increasing equity. And then the fourth part is teaching with our whole selves, strategies for instructional authenticity and pedagogical slash professional success. So I wanted to give sort of a little bit of an overview. Um, and within each overview, I want to ask some questions of you all and have you share those and you can come on to Mike if you feel comfortable with that. If you feel more comfortable participating in our, our shared chat, please do so there, whatever works best for you. So in light of the introduction, so just those few passages about the importance of, you know, what the picture of a professor is and how we can um, challenge those assumptions. Um, what are some stereotypes about what a college professor quote unquote looks like that you've had to contend with either in the classroom or outside of the classroom? Um, and how difficult did you find it to counteract or were you able to counteract those preconceptions of students, colleagues, or supervisors even?
Amanda, this is Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Uh, do you mind repeat the, the question again? Yeah, of course. So what stereotypes about what a college professor, quote unquote, looks like, have you had to contend with either in the classroom or outside of the classroom? And how difficult did you find it to counteract those preconceptions of students, colleagues or supervisors of what, you know, a professor should look like? And then kind of the unsaid part of that is versus what, you know, you look like. I see. Thank you. Um, and I saw in the chat, Kathy and Anna um, have some responses and I want to second that, like, uh, for example, if you can see me in the camera, I always mm -hmm. try to dress up and wear my jacket because I'm short. <laughs> and I'm a woman and I'm a woman of color, but I think mostly because I'm short, so students would think that I'm a peer, so I always try to wear a jacket of some sort. Um, No, definitely. So yeah, Kathy says um, going from being too young to old, too old in a blink. Um, Anna says dressing up versus dressing down, which mat so sometimes you know matters a lot more when you're younger, um, a younger or even just a younger looking um, faculty member. Um, yeah, Kathy seconds that doesn't wear didn't wear jeans in their first few years. Um, yeah, being short, so the height thing can definitely come into play. If you're shorter, does that make you seem less authoritative? Um, you know, do you have to dress to make up for that? Um, and then Christine says, can't appear too fashionable when you're in certain fields or feel like you can't feel appear too fashionable. Uh, hi, this is Kathy. So I just wanted to point out that for, for most of my students today, jeans are actually kind of considered dressy. <laughs> so the <laughs> ethic around that has really changed a lot. I mean, if you see your students in jeans, they're probably dressed up for a presentation or something like that. Yeah, that's a really good point about the changes in, you know, cultural norms when our, you know, with different groups of students. So some, you know, some generations of students, jeans would be a big no-no, um, and now our our students these days um, might think that jeans are more dressy, and you know they might think dressing down is more of wearing like leggings or um, athletic pants or something like that. Oh, I love that. I love that quote you shared, Kelly. If my authority comes from the style of my pants, I have bigger problems. <laughs> to some extent, it was teaching in a professional school. And we had some uh, teachers who or some professors who are wearing like $700 suits and other ones that were more band shirts and jeans and Doc Martens. And I'm not going to say who that was. And we're all teaching finance. And I experimented with it. And my, my students seemed to respect me more when I just came in as is um, in my more comfortable getup. And I was more comfortable and confident, too. So it worked. But yeah, the suit thing, they said, was kind of like being a poser. So OK. <laughs> So yeah, and I think that's such a good, a good point. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think for some of my students, especially my freshman students who are in the 103P courses, if I wore, and I thankfully don't have these in my wardrobe, but if I wore, you know, the fancy watch and, and all that kind of stuff, I think I'd lose them right off the bat. That's a good point. Yeah, so I think, and I think it too, it depends on, you know, what, what is your, what are you, what are you, what are your goals in the classroom, right? So are your goals to, for example, you know, just get in there, teach your students, feel confident, um, you know, is one of the goals of your program or your department to teach professionalization in your field? What does that look like? Why does it look like that? 
you know, are there some um, inequities in in what professionalism tends to look like? And we'll talk about that in a little bit too with, uh, um, I think one of the sections, I can't remember which part it is, but, um, but yeah, like what does professionalism look like? Why does it look like that? I think those are important questions to contend with as well. Um, any other thoughts? So what does, what does a professor look like? So when you, if you asked your students, what does a professor look like? What characteristics do you think they would say a professor looks like? Professors are often old, wild, crazy hair in media. White, I think most of my students expect um, an older white man to teach chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, old white man. That's that's kind of the the picture, the basic picture of a professor, right? Um, yeah, tweed tweed jacket, definitely. Which, I mean, I really like tweed jackets, and I wish that they weren't associated with that. But <laughs> um, patches on the elbows. Um, rumpled kind of looking as well, but you can maybe only get away with that if you are an old white man. Um, Harrison Ford in Harris Tweed. By the way, poor Harrison Ford's teaching assistant who had to take over his classes every semester when he would leave in the middle of a class. All right, so any other thoughts on on this before we move on to the first part? I, just, I want to tell one quick story. So yeah. in my community college years, I taught at College of DuPage, first as part-time um, and then as a full-time tenured professor there. And I took over for a teacher who had heart problems, had surgery. He was a really good friend of mine, but he was older and he was very hippie-esque, kind of 60s, always jeans, very rumpled, kind of the wild white hair and everything. And I think I probably looked a little bit like a law professor <laughs> when I walked into the room <laughs> for them. And yeah, it took a minute. They were very, you are not him. You are so not him. So it, it, it definitely took a while to win them over. But I think the earlier comment about, you know, what if what you look like is is the biggest problem, then you you know, you've really got bigger problems than that. But for for most students, I think most students really kind of want us to do well. So even if they start off with kind of a while, there are ways in. Great. And I on that note, we'll move into oops shoot. I didn't mean to do that. We'll move into talking about the first part, which is about the first day. Um, so in this section of the text, it talks about some strategies for starting strong on the first day of class for um, dismantling preconceptions and biases of what a professor looks like. Um, there is uh, one activity that I actually wanted to describe. There's a few activities, um, and that's the great thing actually I, I found about this text is there's um, not just talking about the issues, but also giving us actionable strategies for um, for how we can improve things in our, our teaching and in the classroom and, and help to push back against those um, or undercut those biases that, that students might come in, preconceptions they might come in with um, about what a professor looks like. Um, so let me find this section here. Um, it's called What Comes to Your Mind, and it's an activity tool for the first day of class, and it helps students recognize and work to transform their potentially problematic biases about who a professor is. Um, and it uses critical reflexivity as a pedagogical tool. Um, so the activity, um, and I won't describe it in, in a lot of detail. You can actually go to the book for that. And she gives a really good um, detailed explanation of how she implements this activity. But um, it builds on some critical de decolonial feminist scholarship and evidence-based teaching informed by critical race theory. And 
basically you ask your students to give you the characteristics of um, you know what a, a professor looks like um, you write down those characteristics then you ask them to transform what their preconceptions are um, and by saying you know what are my characteristics as the instructor, the faculty member, the professor who's here at the front of the classroom. Um, and then also looking for investigating the sources of that knowledge. So why did I imagine an old white male as a professor? Um, and then why did this professor not come to my mind? Um, so that's where, where our critical reflexivity comes in um, and helps not just identify the biases and make students aware of them, um, but also to have students think critically about where those uh, perceptions came from. Um, where did they get that idea from? So some questions that I have for you, and I will... I'll post these to the chat too, just so that um, you have them written down as well. Because um, I know sometimes hearing them and, and seeing them, I know I'm a visual person, um, so I need, need some visual as well. But here are some questions that I just want us to consider next. Um, and again, you know, unmute yourself if you want, or you can post to the chat. Um, but what are your strategies for starting strong on the first day of class? Do you have any strategies for dismantling preconceptions or biases of what a professor looks like on the first day? If so, what do you do? Um, and what do you think about that? What comes to your mind, critical relax, reflexivity activity? And that's in, if you go to this book later on, that's in part one, chapter two. Um, what are some learning techniques you could use in the first class session to get students interested in your subject and enhance their learning throughout the semester? Um, so we get some of that in this, this section as well, some specific techniques for getting started with active learning on the first day of class. So thinking about your uh, second question, Amanda, about strategies mm -hmm. of dismantling preconceptions, something that I like to do like right off the bat is talk to students about who I am and why I'm there. Um, and so talk about, you know, why I'm, I'm in that field, what are sort of my, you know, like what's my degree, why I, mm -hmm. I've gotten that class, um, which is, something that I started because when I started teaching, I was 22 and teaching, you know, a lot of 18 year olds and they were like, why are you here? Um, but it certainly has helped me, you know, as I move through out my career. Um, but something that we talk about is, is professionalism and this concept of what is professional, what do you expect? So not necessarily of, of professor, um, but does this one thing make me better at my job than the other thing? Does my wearing, you know, heels versus loafers versus tennis shoes matter? Does it matter if I'm wearing a tank top because it's 90 degrees outside versus wearing a blouse with a coat? Um, and so we sort of talk about that and interrogate that together because uh, I think that it's important to recognize that we all have, we all have these, these, preconceptions, but also biases, because um, I hear students especially talk about uh, TAs and TIs in ways talking about their professionalism um, mm -hmm. versus people who have the degrees that they expect uh, to be professional and whatnot, and especially women. Um, this person was on their phone or whatever. So that's something that I like to to break down. And usually it's not the first day of class, but like definitely talking about why I'm there um, is is something that I talk about in the first day of class. And then also, you know, 
ask students to share why they're there too. Um, like Kathy brought up this idea of like sort of creating this this situation where it's a, this conversation. What do you think this should look like? What are you bringing to the table as well? Great, thank you for sharing that, Lindsay. Um, Kathy mentions in the chat that um, she once asked the poetry writing students to come to class dressed as their concept of a poet. And one student came as his usual self, but costumes did lead to interesting discussion because they were aspects of who they wanted to be. That's really interesting. I like that idea. Um, Anna says that um, they introduce themselves, their story, try to learn 10 names that day and practice those, add more over time. Um, yeah, those connections are important with students. Um, Christine does icebreaker activities once a week for about three weeks. Um, one is the two truths and a lie activity. Um, and they try to figure out what's the lie. And then you do a class-wide one with your, with your own and students try to guess, that's fun. Um, Roxana sends an email or announcement to introduce herself and background a few days before the start of the semester, shares with them the syllabus and lecture PowerPoint for the first lecture. Yes, it will be 90 degrees when we start in the fall, unfortunately. <laughs> um, a background posted in Blackboard is good too. Um, interviewing, Kelly says interviewing her, um, keeping a feed up so they can ask questions anonymously, trying to answer all of those, um, unless they're too personal. Uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, personal and professional background. Um, so whatever, with whatever you feel comfortable and is appropriate, you know, sharing personally. Yeah, and definitely, Kathy, you could do that with college student, with writer, with with graduate. Um, so you can you can really translate this into, you know, any any identity, right? Any profession. So if you want to be able to get your students to see themselves in your profession, you know, we can you can do that with them too, um, to try to get them to picture themselves um, in that role. Um, international faculty, faculty sharing stories using some sense of humor about their accents. Um, and yeah, that does, you know, help to create that connection with international students and, and um, our minoritized students too, um, sharing things that they might be able to relate to. Great, any other um, ideas for starting strong on the first day of class or um, the what comes to your mind activity or active learning techniques? Uh, Gibson says that they talk a lot about why they're there, what's theater, what's performance, what's storytelling. Um, having each student tell a short story could be about anything. One thing and we talking do about that. Is, yeah, go ahead, Kelly. One thing we do is I, I'm like I said, I teach finance to management majors who don't want to learn finance, which is awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so I have them do a word cloud the first day. And they're like, can I put anything down in there? Because I say mention three words. And they do. And the first one I said, I bet it's boring. And I had taken a similar class to the one I taught years and years ago. And I said, yeah, learning finance is usually boring. And that's my area of study. But when I was in your shoes, it was boring. So uh, yeah, the word cloud is always great because it dispels a lot of like, oh, my professor expects me to be X. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think another good thing to do, I often do this sometime in the first week, is to ask students what they know and believe about writing, which is what I teach. And it's so interesting because, you know, our biases and misperceptions and all of that go along not only with people and appearance, but with subject matter. So it, it's good to talk about that, where that comes from, and to start to dispel some of the, the wrong-headed or damaging notions right off the bat. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
And one thing that I forgot to mention about this book that um, is another benefit to it is th uh, that it really does encompass a, a range of disciplines. So there's really something for everyone. And I think all of the strategies that are presented can easily be adapted to any discipline as well. So there's, you know, a writing course specific chapter. Um, there's specific chapters about, you know, teaching STEM. Um, so you can really find something in every chapter, regardless of what the person who's writing it teaches. Um, that you can apply to your own teaching. Um, so we've started talking a little bit about, um, you, you all have brought up um, making connections with students too. Um, and that's what part two is about of the book. So I'll post a, a couple of, so I'll go over a couple of strategies first um, that are in this, this section um, and a couple of ways that professors recommend to make connections with students. One is experiential learning. Um, and another is collaborative rubrics, which I've done before. Um, and so let's kind of talk about those two things first, because um, they're kind of more um, strategies. And then we'll, we'll talk about um, identity performance, which is another thing that has is brought up in this section. So a couple of questions that I have um, is what what are some types of experiential learning that would be relevant for your subject? Um, some examples that um, are given in the text are guest speakers, tours or field trips, service learning, and documentary viewing and discussion. Um, and then one thing that's brought up in the text as well is obstacles. Um, so a lot of times we don't um, implement experiential learning. We, we recognize how it, beneficial it is to student learning, but we might not implement it because of obstacles that we might encounter to implementation. So what obstacle, obstacles might you encounter if you were going to um, incorporate experiential learning? Um, and then also, like, how did you overcome those obstacles or how have you added experiential learning to your classes if you've done so? Um, and then what's an assessment? There's another part that talks about collaborative rubrics um, as a way to create connections with students. Um, but what's what's an assessment that you could as you assign for which a collaborative rubric could be used effectively um, to build class community and trust while making grading more transparent and the assessment process more authentic? So pick whichever one of these kind of speaks to you the most. Um, Kathy mentions cost and freedom can be obstacles to experiential learning, definitely. And freedom in what way, Kathy? Oh, um, so I think for some teachers, if, you know, if you're a graduate student, if you're part-time faculty, um, something like that, it can be hard to, you know, it it's, can be effortful at least to get permission if you're going to go on a field trip, to mm -hmm. um, make connections with the community if you want to do service learning, to make sure that you're following all the rules, that kind of stuff. So you're a lot more mm -hmm. empowered to do that, I think, when you're when you're full time and your position is pretty secure and maybe when you feel more experienced about the program, who to ask, how to get permission, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, definitely. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, sure. But on the point of, um, of rubrics, I, I have very mixed feelings about rubrics. I'll start right off with that <laughs> because I think that they can become crutches really quickly. It's as though a student couldn't even consider doing the assignment if there weren't a, like a very detailed rubric. But one thing I do like doing is asking students to create the rubric themselves. And especially in upper division classes, that works out really well because as I say to them, look, I'm not going to follow you around in your first professional position. And when you get your first assignment, like, you can't call me and say, what's the rubric for this? I mean, well, you could, and I'd probably help you, but realistically, <laughs> that's not going to work going forward. So I asked them to create rubrics after maybe the first assignment or so for each thing we do. And then it's, it's so much easier for me to point out to them, because those are usually juniors and seniors in the professional writing classes, that they're ready to go do this. And in the, in the professional workplace, 
where they're going to have to come up with the rubric themselves, if rubrics really do make them more secure, they can create them. They don't need an outside entity to do that for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I've done creative or uh, collaborative rubrics with my first year composition students. Um, so have them do some research on whatever genre of writing they're going to be doing. What what is, you know, what does that genre of writing look like? What do they want to be? What do they think they should be assessed on in their essay? Um, and that gives them some ownership over it, gives them some autonomy, it helps them learn, I think, learn more um, about the genre than if I'm just telling them about it because they have to exactly. figure it out for themselves. And bonus, it's also a writing and editing activity because we usually sort of divvy it up and then the class has to come mm -hmm. together and put it all together and then we can put it up there and collaboratively edit it. So the whole thing mm -hmm. works out really well. It's empowering for them. Yeah. And one piece of advice that some, one of the authors in the book says is, is instead of calling things um, like group work, calling it teamwork because students have this aversion to group work. But if you call it something else, <laughs> then, you know, they don't have that gut, first gut reaction of Ugh, group work. I hate group work. So I might try that and see if I get fewer groans. So, Amanda, I have a question um, whether the mm -hmm. book make any recommendation for large class size, like over 150 students and also mm -hmm. um, in in STEM field with uh, particularly general chemistry, um, the the course is specifically meant to be a lecture course because they have the lab portion that come with it, where they have um, where they actually do experimental learning. So mm -hmm. I wonder if the book have any recommendation for such courses, how to incorporate some experimental learning in the lecture large classroom setup? Yeah, I think um, they're, they're definitely, they definitely do address large class sizes. Um, they address online as well. Um, so how you might uh, adapt certain things for online um, courses. And I think the online piece could definitely work for larger class sizes. So things that you can get them to do experientially online, like, um, you know, having them watch a documentary, for example, um, and inserting. So with, with Kaltura, you can do a Kaltura quiz and you can insert sort of questions or, or reflection points throughout that um, video to kind of break it up a bit. Um, so yeah, there are some things that you, you know, you can't do in a larger classroom some things that you can um, have them some ways that you can adapt it so for the collaborative rubric for example um, that could be that doesn't necessarily have to be something that you do in class because that could be definitely become unruly with 150 students um, but you know can you have some sort of teams or groups um, you know set them up into teams in the large class size and then have them within their teams collaborate in a shared document on you know what the rubric should look like and then you can take those shared documents and go through them and then have put them together into some sort of collective document that applies to the whole class um, to make things easier for yourself um, instead of having to you know assess each group based on that groups shared rubric um but yeah small group discussions as kathy says um you know having having them get together into smaller groups definitely helps um using things like i think someone already mentioned mentioned um polls yeah roxana mentioned poll questions um which yeah, there's an obstacle about uh, assigning points to that. Um, but yeah, so using polling, um, clickers or clicker software, polling software, um, and, you know, getting that class collaboration um, in that way as well using technology. No problem, Roxana. I hope that helps. But yeah, there are specific examples of scalability um, 
in the text too. So, and they they talk about STEM quite. A, there's a, quite a few STEM faculty in there. Um, uh, can I just you know have a comment here? Like you know, mm -hmm. Lynn and I, you know, we teach chemistry STEM courses, and as she pointed out especially for introductory chemistry. We have like 150 students in a classroom. And it seems to me like very difficult for making students to open up asking mm -hmm. questions and try to engage students uh, like in a classroom setting. Most the students, they feel intimidated or shy to raise their hand or answer the question. I always have a handful number of students always volunteer to engage and answer questions. Whether the class is in person or online, it seems that I usually get the same group of students in reply and try to um, <clears throat> like, you know, uh, participate in the and um, that's why I prefer using poll because poll is anonymous and they can, it just gives them that sort of, you know, comfort blanket, if you will, that they can participate and be anonymous. And if they answer the question wrong, there is no like, all right, I, I gave a wrong answer and everybody in the classroom right now knows that I give the wrong answer. And, but then, you know, with that comes the, like, if I want to encourage students to participate, then I cannot assign them extra credit points for answering and participating in the poll question. So that is the trade off of using poll instead of using the quiz or like, you know, those cultural uh, embedded questions or such things like mm -hmm. that. And um, so I was wondering that, like, is has anyone has um, like same experience as I do? And if they have a similar experience to me, you know, what are the, the their suggestions? Have done, you know, what have they done to overcome this barrier, this interacting with the students barrier, and making them feel comfortable and open up and be open and okay to make mistakes in the classroom in participating in that learning activity so for students you know for them to feel comfortable that it's okay to make a mistake yeah and we'll open that up so does anyone have any um I actually have a I'm link with some ideas, so let me track down that link and I'll Great. post it just a second. Um, I use polling in my classes at the beginning, and let's say some students might answer a question wrong. I, I don't always say they're wrong. I'll say, um, I see why you think that. Um, let's talk about that some more, why you might think that. And then once they see that it's okay that they might have answered it incorrectly, and I'll do this probably for a few weeks at the beginning. And then after that, the students will see like, oh, a lot of people think the same way I do, or it's okay if I answered it kind of wrong. Um, they seem to be open up more. So then I'll use more like queries so that I can actually track their answers and they can also track their own answers. Um, and then they are more open to answering questions. And so I've noticed um, in the last two semesters of doing this that it seems to have a positive impact. Yeah, all right. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah, I, I try to do that too. You know, when the student says a wrong answer, I'm like, that's a very good answer. I would have answered the same way, you know, in this and that. Um, but it just, I don't know, it's just the, um, the nature of chemistry course that you know feel makes a student feel that they should not open up and they should not say anything and um but thank you so much christine for your feedback i'll definitely you know keep that in mind and i keep um like you know pushing for that and making sure that i can have more and more number of students engage in the or participate in the classroom discussions um, Roxana. Yeah. Uh, hi, no this problem. is Gibson. Uh, my students are a little bit more self-selecting probably because they're all theater students, but even among the theater students, I struggle with this same issue. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that I've started to do is to give the students like a five minute break 
and tell them not to jump on their phones, but instead to engage their neighbor in conversation, because a lot of them don't know each other. Um, and they'll sit in class next to each other for the entire semester and not speak to one another, which is totally bizarre to me, but totally normal for them. Um, <laughs> and, and then I do a lot of uh, theater games, even in a big class. So even if I've got like 100 people in the room, I can break them up into smaller groups. And we do kind of like zip, zap, zop or, you know, icebreaker games. And that does help you know, to build these relationships, teams, build teams, I guess, instead of groups, um, and uh, and kind of lighten them up a little bit. Uh, and then they want to participate more. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Gibson, for your feedback. Uh, keep that in mind. And uh, I'm sure that it's going to help me a lot, you know, when I walk into the classroom at the beginning of semester in August. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone, for sharing all that. Um, we'll move on to part three, um, just sort of running a little bit low on time, which is totally fine. Love the conversation um, and that I'm, I'm very glad when I'm running out of time rather than <laughs> trying to stretch things out. Um, so in part, part three is about anti-racist pedagogy. Um, and one concept that uh, is brought up as code switching, which you've probably heard of. Um, but it's basically um, acting a certain way in a certain situation. And for for uh, with race, that has to do with, for example, if you're an African-American um, professor having to, quote unquote, act white or use the proper quote unquote language, uh, standard American English versus other varieties of English. Um, so has code switching affected your teaching, your students' learning experiences? Um, our students also experience uh, moments where they feel that it's necessary to code switch. Um, and I know we have some writing faculty here, so that will definitely, as a writing faculty, I definitely um, can see that within the discipline itself and the emphasis on standard American English. So um, any thoughts on code switching? And let me just read um, one passage that kind of illustrates this. Um, but in Anders and Joetta's um, chapter, they say anti-racism is an important pedagogical framework because black and brown students deserve to be in a classroom where pain isn't part of the lesson plan and where fear of being found out to be a fraud isn't reinforced with racist writing pedagogy that favors one linguistic variation over another. Students deserve to be in a classroom where their whole selves are welcomed and celebrated, including their language choices. Anti-racism teaches us to focus on the needs of the student rather than the needs of systems of oppression. Kathy mentions the open mic event where students are encouraged and free to tell their own stories and their own voices. I actually, I think too, it's it's really good to talk openly about imposter syndrome in class because I think that's one of those things where we're all pretty sure we're the only one who's experiencing that and <laughs> everyone else is fine and they're so expert and they're so chill and comfortable but but no I mean scratch the surface just a little bit I think that's something most of us have experienced and probably will experience again whenever we're in a new setting so especially in my freshman classes it's important to to know that there's discomfort in becoming a college student and that that doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. That just probably means it's it's going well, it's challenging and it's supposed to be challenging. And that can mm -hmm. include making mistakes, having some failures, all that kind of stuff. And I think sharing our own stories of, you know, falling down and then getting back up can be helpful. Definitely, and, and uh, storytelling is definitely a, a 
one of the chapters in the book in part four on authenticity actually talks about storytelling as a way to build trust with students and to build a supportive class community. I I have a um, more more like a question. So um, mm -hmm. I am not a black person. I'm a woman um, and and an immigrant. So English is my second mm -hmm. language, and I speak English with an accent. So I find myself I tend to like um, enunciation of my word. I pay more attention to it when I have to teach my class and. Um, and I want to ask for uh, people who identify themselves as white and, and um, English is the first language. Do you speak um, when you find yourself in professional setting or uh, in, in front of the, the class, do you feel like you have to use a, a different type of speaking skill, like using less slang and more monotone inflection? Or is it just like the minority people that do? I, I don't, I don't think that's just a, a minority issue. I think that I would say most of us have many voices, many codes that we speak in. I think I probably will curse in front of my class as things go along and they get really comfortable with me, probably a bit more formal at first, but it, it, you know, as the class gets to know each other and you get more comfortable, you can't help it. That said though, when we are talking about things in our area of professional expertise, we're gonna use some words and language for precision that might be out of student's reach at first, and that's okay. I mean, part of what we're doing is teaching them the language of our disciplines and the language of college. Uh, thanks, Kelly, for, thank you, Kathy, and thanks, Kelly, for um, posting in the chat about um, neurodivergence and uh, using it as a discussion point if someone comments on it. Um, so definitely taking it on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess, of, you know, when, for me, I've, in the past, when I was, I think, younger <laughs> and looked more like the age of my students, I might have spoken differently to them and behaved differently um, in order to, you know, have that sense of authority in the classroom that wasn't inherited as soon as I stepped into the classroom. Um, but yeah, I think, especially, you know, women, um, you know, I was a young woman, I was 25, 26, 25, <laughs> when I started, 25, um, when I started teaching college students and I looked, you know, their age. So I always had that first day of class um, where I would be sitting at the the instructor's desk at the front of the room and people would be giving me weird looks because like, why are you sitting? So, and then I stand up at the beginning of class and introduce myself and they're like, they would always comment about, oh, you're the, you're teaching this class. I thought you were just a weird person, weird student sitting at the teacher's desk. Um, but yeah, it, so I, I felt the need to do that more before. Um, I've tried to intentionally create more of a connection with my students and a rapport so I might I speak don't speak to them as or try to speak as formally now as I might have prior um, just because I'm trying to kind of create those connections with my students of course it's not the same as you know how I talk to my friends though yeah and definitely as Kathy mentioned sometimes that highfalutin stuff can and does flow from insecurity um, you know, so, and I still feel that, you know, when I walk into a classroom, I, I can still feel that, um, that imposter phenomenon. Like, ugh, what if they find out that I'm a fraud? And <laughs> <laughs> but still, we drop in language that doesn't seem highfalutin to us anymore. You know what I mean? You get to this certain level of education and experience, and that's, that's just the word for it, you know? So it is good right. 
to invite students to, to stop us or just to be aware ourselves and say, oh, I just dropped this word. Do we know what that means? No, let's, here's a place where I can invite everybody to drag out their phone in class. Drag out your phone, look that up, shout out the mm -hmm. definitions and we can discuss. So yeah, I mean, a big part of going to college is, is learning another language at first learning the the beginning language of a lot of different disciplines and then going deep into one. Yeah, definitely. And I think too, one of the things that I appreciate about the book is they talk about languages and, and varieties of English. And it's not, it doesn't, not necessarily about disciplinary language, um, but that's part of it. And kind of looking at why do we, um, why do we value one variety of language over another variety of language and what part does um, you know white supremacy um, have of the institution have over why we prioritize one variety of English over another for example or English over um, you know English without an accent versus English with an accent why you know what are the the biases that are inherent in the system that we can work to dismantle too through our teaching. Um, so we're running a little bit short on time here. We've got three minutes left. So I want to just share one quote from part four on authenticity um, and then just kind of leave you with a question. Um, if you want to stick around and answer the question, great. If not, just kind of ruminate on it. Um, but in part four, uh, Atkins says, they want to advocate for a paradigm shift from professionalism being equated with middle class, white, heterosexual expression to professionalism consisting of authentic gender, race, sexual orientation, and cultural expression. And they argue that that would be profoundly helpful in the recruitment and retention of faculty of color and other marginalized faculty. Um, and the question that I had about that was, what are some co some of the conflicts between professionalism and authenticity that you've experienced in your identity um, as an educator? Um, so if you want to stick around and, and, and chat on that, that's great. If not, um, uh, if you have any questions, you can also stick around and I'll answer those. Um, here's my contact information if you have any questions for me and be uh, on the lookout for an email from me either later today or um, tomorrow with a, a follow-up for today's session with some resources, um, as well as the recording of today's session. And then if you need to get together with um, anyone from CIDL for help, we can help you online, um, we can help you over the phone, we can do web conferencing. Um, so you can go to our help page for um, more information on how to connect with us there. Um, check out our upcoming programs as well. Um, our Teaching Effectiveness Institute for faculty registration, I believe, is open for that now. So you can take a look at, at that there. Um, and if not, it'll become available very soon. Um, and then our CIDL website, of course, has a bunch of different resources and tutorials and um, different things that'll help you out um, with whatever teaching, pedagogy, um, or instructional technology need you have. Uh, thanks, everyone. And again, stick around if you have any questions um, or if you wanted to answer that, that last question. But keep, keep a, that in mind. And also, I definitely recommend reading the book for sure because there's a lot of great stuff in there that we weren't able to really dig into in just an hour conversation. But have a great rest of your week, too.